Good evening. My name is Claire Haley from the Atlanta History Center. I am absolutely thrilled to be welcoming you all this evening to our event with authors Michael Dobbins and Randall Rourke. They will be discussing their book, which they co-authored along with their late co-author, Leon Eplin, Atlanta's Olympic Resurgence, How the 1996 Games Revived a Struggling City. You can purchase a copy of the book this evening from Atlanta History Center's museum store. Uh, we offer both on-site pickup and shipping if you don't live in Atlanta, so I'll post a link to do that in the chat shortly. Tonight, uh, Michael and Randall will also be taking your questions, so if you have questions for them throughout their presentation, just go ahead and drop those in the Q&A, and when we get to the end of their presentation, we'll save some time at the end to make sure that you get your questions answered. So just a brief introduction of our two guests this evening. Randall Rourke is a retired professor of the College of Planning Architecture at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And he served as the Director of Planning and Design for the Corporation for the Olympic Development in Atlanta for the 1996 Games. Michael Dobbins succeeded Leon Eplin in 1996, becoming Atlanta's Commissioner of Planning, Development, and Neighborhood Conservation for the following six years. Serving in that position during and after the Games, he was able to finalize several uncompleted ODP projects following the Games, as well as oversee several major post-Olympics initiatives that were related to or induced by the Games. So they really have the inside knowledge of this time, here, the week of the 25th anniversary of the games. We're just delighted that they're able to join us. Michael and Randall, welcome to Atlanta History Center virtually. Thank you for being here this evening. Thank you. Happy to be here. Good to be here. Can we start? Yeah, let's go ahead and kick off your presentation. Do you see the slide on the screen? We do. I do. Excellent. Yeah, it's all yours. Okay. Well, I think to begin with, uh, we uh, need to pay particular homage to uh, Leon Eplin, who is our uh, partner in this uh, enterprise and basically worked very hard with uh, Maynard Jackson, who had a great deal of confidence in Leon, uh, hiring him both as commissioner of planning and budget back in his first two terms. And then as soon as it was clear that Atlanta was in line to get the Olympics, uh, he hired him back and begged him to come back. And Leon wrapped up his practice and came to join the city. For me, the, most, the greatest significance of Leon's role in this whole affair is to inject serious, well thought out, expert planning expert, uh, knowledge into the processes that he launched under Maynard Jackson's uh, guidance uh, to, to prepare the city, to set up the collaborations and necessary uh, agreements among the different parties who created uh, the, the games, and, and then to set up uh, uh, the the follow up in such a way that uh, reflected all three of us are professional planners, many years experience, and so the the tradition of planning proceeded. And Leon gets, I think, a lot of credit for 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 the beginning of of, of preparing the city for the Olympics. And if I can just add a note about Leon, uh, knew and worked with Leon for over fifty years, and. Um, he was a major impetus for getting this book underway. And in fact, uh, although he, he passed away, uh, kind of ironically, the same week the book came out, uh, the spring, he was working hard with us, collaborating right up until the end of last year before we actually went into publication mode. And Leon was Leon the entire time, uh, not only contributed, but pushed Mike and me the whole way to make it better and uh, to add to it. And so we'd like to pay him that respect before we get started as kind of the, uh, the granddaddy of professional city planning in Atlanta. We're happy to, to uh, collaborate on this with him. And so the structure of the book is on this slide. We're basically going to briefly talk about why the book, why we did the book and who we are and what our roles were. 
and then uh, spent a good bit more time on what the book is about, uh, beginning with the uh, sort of brief history of Atlanta at the time of the 90s and, uh, uh, and, and, and so on. But uh, uh, first, I think we should talk about why we came to write this book. And I think that might be, is that the next slide? Go to the next slide, yeah. Yeah, look at there, why the book? Mike, you'll talk, talk about uh, Margarita since she's the one that- Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm sitting in my office at Georgia Tech and I get a call from a woman named Margarita Sanudo, who's a doctoral uh, candidate at ETH in, in, uh, in Zurich. And she's coming to Atlanta to find out about the Atlanta Olympics. She was writing her dissertation on four different Olympics, uh, the two before and one after our Atlanta Olympics. And she uh, told us, and we hadn't, hadn't really thought about it, that there was really never had been a comprehensive treatment of pivotal years in, in Atlanta's history. Uh, there may be five or six pivotal uh, periods in Atlantic's hi hi history, and this was clearly one of them. So since the three of us were friends and colleagues and working together on a variety of things, we said, you know what? No one else is writing this, <clears throat> and I think we should go ahead and do it. I think one of the uh, particular advantages, if I can toot our horn a little bit, is that, that planners, <clears throat> by training and by commitment, are always trained to think comprehensively not about this part or some other part of, of the story, but to really tie it all together in a contextual set of relationships so that people understand the social, physical uh, development, planning, and, and uh, construction implementation aspects of, of any uh, enterprise, however large or small, and this one was huge. True, and we're really talking about uh, uh, gaps in the record and in the history uh, it was not as if there was nothing at all. Of course, the Atlanta Committee for the, of the Olympic Games and uh, along with the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, did a, a beautiful job of recording the games themselves, the winning of the bid and the events uh, during the time of, of the Olympics that summer. But the rest of the record was pretty spotty and if it existed at all. And we felt like it was important to put the Olympics in the context of the city's history, its development, its problems, and cover it from about five years before the Olympics to five to 10 years after the Olympics to talk about the impact and the legacy of the game. So we've tried to put all of that in this book uh, and of course pay homage to the event itself, but to all the other parts of the story. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the key parts of our roles and our position, we were all working on behalf or in the city uh, and for the city, and we were uh, seeking to do the best we could to honor Mayor Jackson's commitment to okay, if the if we're getting the Olympics, which is mainly a private sector generated event, huge, event, then by golly, something's got to happen that's good for the city as well. And he did that combination of the twin peaks of the Olympics in which he began in his direction to Leon at the uh, uh, Olympic development program that Leon put together made it very clear that if this event is happening to Atlanta, we've got to do everything we can to benefit the neighborhoods, particularly the core neighborhoods uh, circling where most of the events in the Olympics occurred. So it was, it was the, in the book, there's a, there's a sort of page long description from Leon about uh, how he called in the middle of the night from somewhere to, you know, Tokyo, I guess, saying, Leon, you got to come to the city and help us put this program together because it's got to benefit the city, not just be a one-off thing, which is sort of a, an Atlanta a tradition of doing one-off projects. And we did our level best to do the connectivity, the collaboration, uh, uh, the, the uh, development, the funding, the planning process is necessary. Uh, carry this thing off. So we might be able to go to the next slide, maybe? Sure. Yeah, oh, yeah. This won't take very long because uh, Claire pretty much introduced us. Yeah, we're three old white guys who played critical roles 
uh, in, in the lead up to liberty and so on. And she pretty much uh, uh, described who we are, who we were, and, and, and we've described our interest in proceeding to try to record this. It's kind of cool, actually, when you think about it, you see all white guys collaborating on anything. It's kind of a rarity, but we, we pulled this off. Uh, I might just say uh, in this context, Leon and Mike, of course, held the basically the same position, uh, Leon before up to 96 and Mike following on as commissioners of uh, planning and neighborhood conservation in the city for uh, the city government. And my job was uh, planning director for the Corporation for Olympic Development, which we'll talk a little bit about, which was a separately formed corporation uh, really by, by Maynard Jackson, uh, kind of public-private corporation whose job it was to uh, make the improvements uh, to the city outside of the Olympic venues in preparation for the games. So I was uh, about one step removed from City Hall, but nevertheless, we were all in uh, very, very public positions during this uh, 12, 15 year period. So maybe we go to the next one. You take the lead on this one. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, we, we talk about the legacy in two ways and uh, this slide is, one way and uh, the next slide will cover the other. And one of course is the, the physical legacy of the games, uh, which is the actual uh, construction and, um, and the venues and uh, the improvements that were made to the city. And the legacy uh, is that they were left behind in both cases for the, for the uh, Atlanta committee, the most of the uh, venues for the Olympics are, are still out there. There have been some changes, of course, but more than most cities, uh, they're, they're still there and uh, they may not quite be doing exactly what people envisioned, but uh, they're on the ground. And most of the improvements that we made outside the venues, which had to do with parks and streetscapes and public art and neighborhood improvements and some housing development, most of all, those are out there too. And our intent was to make sure that the legacy, uh, this was not an event that came and uh, pitched the tent and then left when it was over, but that it uh, that had some kind of impact and, and, and leverage the uh, opportunity of the Olympics to, uh, to you know, make improvements in the city. So you see, uh, we can come back and uh, question and answer on certain venues and improvements, but in addition to the uh, the main venues and of course Centennial Olympic Park, which we'll talk about some, uh, and then the other public places that were done and then the, the neighborhoods um, and improvement to the neighborhoods in the, in the venues. Uh, the, the real thing that, that we noticed and that the book points out in, even in the preface is that there was some kind of change in the 90s as a result of this investment that uh, made a signal that perhaps it was okay to uh, return to the city as a place to live. And we'll talk about that a little bit and about the conditions uh, the city found itself in in, in the early 90s. Um, and so we're talking about a kind of sea change that uh, kind of turned the city around. It was not just the Olympics. There were other things in the 90s that were, that were also quite positive. Uh, demographic shifts, and uh, a booming economy, but all came together to actually uh, created a signal that the uh, inside uh, the perimeter uh, was a city that uh, was deserving of uh, a quality of life, uh, both in neighborhoods and downtown that could be uh, that could be reconstructed. And so that was really kind of the main physical legacy of the games. And we'll cover each of these uh, as we go along. Yeah, one, one of the things I don't think we've emphasized enough is the population shifts that Randy's alluding to. Uh, Atlanta had uh, about uh, uh, 500,000 people in the 1960s. It lost about 100,000 people over the next 25 years or so. 
So in the 90s, leading up to this era or being part of this era, uh, Atlanta was a city that was shrinking in a region that was growing exponentially. Uh, by, fueled by uh, federal programs that supported the suburbanization for white people, didn't for black, uh, business development, so on and so forth. So was, the, the city's population was, was dropping. Uh, the conditions in downtown, I, I imagine most of the audience has, doesn't recall what the downtown core of the city looked like. And as we know about cities, it's, having a strong center is vital for having a strong region. And a lot of what the code of plan, basically the program that Leon put together and code of assessment as to which of these were feasible to get done and trying to get them done and getting a lot of them done, uh, coincided with shifts in markets uh, where a lot of folks growing up in suburbs uh, got to thinking after years of, of sort of disinvestment and disinterest in core cities that maybe it's okay to live in a city. And, and you know, the Dakota plan and its improvements basically really reacted to and supported and led creating, recreating a, a, an environment uh, that was very attractive to a much broader range of people than what had been before. I mean, think about sidewalks in 1990 on Peachtree, five feet wide, broken up, uh, so on and so forth, and getting getting the streetscape standards established and making those standards attractive to other areas where investment was being attracted. I mean, I could go on and on. About, I think what I'd say is that I've worked in a lot of public agencies in California and New York and New Orleans and Birmingham and so on. And I don't think I've ever experienced anything like the production that, that CODA was able to achieve in the period of time and on the shoestring budget that it was given. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it was a transformative thing and it happened in a way that affected both neighborhoods for the most part, possibly a little bit of pushback that usually accompanies uh, uh, new investment in neighborhoods, uh, but basically setting a new set of standards. And what was lucky for me is that I was able to say, hey, this is great. Uh, we can extend this this way, that way, the other way. We can actually follow through on the neighborhood development programs that, uh, that go to put together and expand on them and set up structures that were guided by the NTUs in the neighborhoods to decide what to do. So it, it's, a, it's a pretty stunning uh, 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 achievement uh, on 70 million bucks in three years. And especially in, in, in a municipal government situation where things take forever. We have some explanation about that in the book. I might say just something uh, without trying to present the plan that's on the screen, but the kind of image that it is, uh, what it represents. Uh, for those of you who might have been here for the Olympics, you'll know that, that ACOG, the Committee for the Games, uh, bit off quite a challenge when it decided to put most of the venues downtown and to actually disperse them around downtown. Now, part of that, most of that was because of the existing facilities uh, that already were there. And so it created four or five different areas in the downtown area where venues would be located. And not all of them were connected at the time to the MARTA stations, only one or two. So the city had the challenge and ACOG had the challenge to kind of connect the dots between the venues. Uh, and it did so with a whole a series of pedestrian corridors that linked the MARTA stations to the venues and then began to link throughout the city and into the adjoining neighborhoods. So uh, the, the green lines you see begin to suggest that the, the entire plan uh, that the city put together uh, was one that was based on connectivity, which to connect the disparate pieces of downtown and then connect back into the adjacent neighborhoods and start to weave back together uh, a, a downtown that was a little more connected. And it was not a program of reconnection because in many ways, the, these parts of the city were never connected in the first place, thanks to the railroad uh, properties to the highways and to Jim Crow laws that kept these pieces pretty much separate. 
And so connecting them was a kind of first time uh, effort. And, and it, it kind of created a change in the kind of uh, culture of the inner area and hopefully a culture of connectivity. The circle you see yeah. was an area called the Olympic ring, which is a three mile diameter ring was arbitrarily set by Billy Payne and ACOG, which just collected the main venues downtown and more or less centered on, on the center of the downtown district uh, in and yes. around uh, Woodruff Park. Yeah. Three or four points about that. First of all, I think it was really both forethoughtful and in retrospect vital that the concentration of venues that were already in existence at the time became the focus of ACOG's activity. It basically focused on the core of the city. And, and that's very different from most Olympics where venues are scattered all over the place and they're not really created in, 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 in the connectivity that Randy's talking about to have the kind of impact that ours did. Second point, I think, is that that connectivity was not just physical connectivity. It began to uh, oblige people uh, from uh, impoverished black neighborhoods that existed in the area uh, and, and uh, white uh, supremacists, white supremacist people who really controlled the, uh, uh, the economy and, and, and the political pulse of the city had to work together they all agreed on one thing to begin with, we're going to get it done. We got to get it done. We got to get it done on time. So I, I was able to, in the three, three months that I was in the city before the Olympics began, uh, witnessing meeting after meeting after meeting on a daily basis where you could really feel the tensions between the emergent and, and uh, uh, black political power and the uh, old style uh, white economic power, said, both saying, hey, we're going to get it done. You got to do this. We got to do that. We got to collaborate. And the pattern and habits of those collaborations were one of the main things I think that uh, that carried forward for for the, the up until the early two thousands or so. Probably still going on, but that was really it was fun to watch actually to to see. Uh, you could feel the tensions. You could feel a little bit of arrogance on the part of the white people in the room. You could feel a little bit of resentment on the part of the black people in the room. Uh, and yet uh, the, to get something like that done in essentially three years is, is a phenomenal accomplishment. And what that leads to is really the second half of the legacy is really one of establishing ways to collaborate uh, in addition to the physical legacy. and. Uh, Claire, I think that might take us to the next slide. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe, yeah, let's, uh, let that, uh, that slide begins to get at it. And uh, uh, again, I think I mentioned earlier, Mayor Jackson's Twin Peaks vision was, okay, we're gonna make the Olympics happy, happen and they're gonna be great, but we're also gonna revitalize the city to the extent we can, or at least start uh, that process. And uh, the, it included uh, collaborations that were uh, economic, investment collaborations, uh, uh, physical uh, connectivity, the NPU system, which I think most of the audience is probably familiar with, which, by the way, was established by Leon Eplin and Maynard Jackson in his first year or so in office back in the 70s. And uh, our, our work with neighborhoods, with NPUs, so we, we took the... Uh, uh, the, the six uh, neighborhoods or seven neighborhoods that Coda was able to develop detailed uh, redevelopment plans, and we extended that to the 32 neighborhoods that, would, uh, that were funded in part by the uh, empowerment zone that came on in the, in the late, in, before, the, before the Olympics in about 1994. So uh, it, the, the relations were, were shifting. Uh, the gradually, at least in my experience during my period of time, uh, there were ways of working out uh, what we'll call a win-win situation or at least a no-lose situation. Not perfect, but basically shifting from being uh, most of the money, most of the resources, most of the investment, most of the political power, most of the economic power residing in the white community and, and the political power gaining ground consistently in, in the black community. So bringing those together and, and, and the deadline, the idea of actually having a deadline has got to be done 
is a very compelling way to bring together disparate interests with their different measures of what success means. Uh, uh, a point of agreement, we're not going to screw this up, we're going to deliver it. And I think and, uh, before we go uh, look at the the legacy aspects of the Olympics after the games in the period of time, uh, let me let me point out that there is a chapter in the book that looks at the Atlanta Olympics in the context of other Olympic games, both before and after. Uh, there's an entire body of literature and a whole lot of people that study these big mega events, particularly the Olympics, and so there's really quite a bit of data to draw upon. And we did a little bit of that in chapter four, I think, to, to position the Olympics in the context of the Olympic movement. And there are a couple things. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, there's an appendix with a whole lot of numbers and, and data to show that, that I won't go into. But there are a couple of things that I think came away with uh, looking at the Olympics in that way. Uh, as most people know, Billy Payne set out to uh, to uh, put on the Olympics in a way that was mostly privately financed and did not leave the city with any municipal debt. That, in fact, happened. Uh, depending on the numbers you look at, it might have been a little bit in debt or a little bit uh, ahead, but basically it, it broke even. The other thing was it wasn't all privately financed. Uh, the federal government did an audit after the Olympics in the 2000s, and it, the, the federal government did not directly get involved, as it usually doesn't with American-based Olympics in funding the games, but there were almost, there was almost $600 million of federal money spent during the run-up to the Olympics across 24 different federal agencies coming from all different manner of, of, uh, of agencies and bureaus and in, involved both uh, physical development as well as security and other services during the games. The other thing to put it in context is uh, Atlanta's Olympics cost about $3 billion when you, you look at what a, the ACOG did and, when, and what the other improvements that were made, including the airport and MARTA and some of the transportation improvements. That is by far the cheapest, if I can use that word, Olympics in this 50 year period, uh, the least expensive. Uh, you compare that to Beijing, who we don't know exactly how much Beijing spent in uh, 2008, uh, but it's in excess of $45 billion. So Atlanta was, was somewhere below 10% of what the Beijing Olympics cost. And of course, it was mostly financed by the, by the, the People's Republic, the national government. So we had the interesting uh, distinction of being the cheapest but we also had the interesting distinction of selling the most tickets and having the biggest attendance of any Olympics before or after. Uh, we can, you can look at a number of reasons for that, mostly because it's in the States and it was, Atlanta's pretty easy to get to and a lot of people came. And most of the tickets that were sold, actually people filled the seats, which is not always the case with Olympics around, around the world. So we sold almost eight and a half million tickets. London sold almost as many, about the same, but none of the other Olympics since then have come uh, even close to that. So we had the most people and it cost the least amount of money. And you can put that together and, and see how some of the things coming out of the Olympics may have, may have gone down. Uh, there's some interesting things uh, that happened during the Olympics. Of course, the tragic uh, the, the tragic uh, bombing at Centennial Park, which occurred because it was everybody's intent to leave that park wide open for anybody to come day and night and enjoy the, uh, the festivities, which is not usually the case for most Olympic uh, venues. They're usually fenced off pretty heavily and secured. Um, and, and then there, in addition to all the, all the people that were, uh, were milling about, uh, you had the vending program, which was a rather interesting commercial spectacle that if people were here, might people might remember is not a particularly positive 
impact uh, on the games. Uh, you had a bus system that struggled to get people back and forth uh, in addition to the MARTA trains. Um, and you had a number of other challenges that occurred during the games. But by and large, the events came off almost flawlessly themselves. And uh, the city was left uh, with these improvements and without any real debt. So if there's anybody in the audience that wants to pursue that line, it's in the book, but we were not going to focus on that this evening. And uh, if we go to, uh, Mike, you want to go to the next slide to the- No, to the, well, a the couple of comments on that that I think okay. are interesting. I just happened uh, yesterday to look at Tokyo. And uh, of course, Tokyo and selling seats doesn't go very well together and to be COVID and so on. But the, the Tokyo Olympics are estimated before the fact as to costing $15 billion, or roughly five times what, what the Atlanta Olympics cost. The other thing that's interesting about it, and this is typical of most Olympics, and I think one of the things that came out of our experience sort of points to this, uh, most of the money comes from, from federal or governmental sources. So in Tokyo, uh, 10 billion is coming from, from uh, uh, the government in one form or another, and the other 5 billion is coming from, from other sources, private sources, and so on. The other thing that I think happened in, in relation to this, and by the way, anybody interested in these numbers, they're very richly prepared and detailed and cited, is that uh, the, uh, uh, the, at the same time, the structure for delivery of the Olympics in Atlanta would had much more interaction and involvement between people in Atlanta and different neighborhoods and so on. Again, harking back to Maynard Jackson's goal and, and Leon's goal. And uh, so I think those are uh, important aspects. And one of the things that we argue is, you know, make these things more collaborative, make them more transparent. And that has basically not happened probably in reaction to what, what we've done. It'd be very interesting to see how Tokyo works out uh, under these really constrained situations. Yeah, we can go on to the next slide. Yeah, so basically, uh, as the Olympics were winding down, uh, and I was in the commissioner's seat, uh, and and we had a we had. By, by the way, one thing we haven't really commented on is that the city government's top leadership, the mayor, chief operating officer Byron Marshall, other people, Sharon Gay, Steve Labovitz. Um, the the uh, Susan P. Langford, the necessity of getting the city government to function way beyond uh, any expectation at the time, I think was really impressive. Uh, there's, there are any number of stories that you can tell about they did this, they did that, they did that, and, and they didn't do it much before, and it's, it's difficult afterward. So I think what happened, uh, we, we came out of the Olympics, the the white press in particular was very say, okay, that's my little uh, uh, hang up. You see, that's Atlanta's last hurrah. We're getting all kind of contrary stuff like that and, uh, from, from the white press. Uh, as it basically aimed at, at the administration, the city administration. And, uh, but what we did, and, and uh, Mayor Campbell and Byron Marshall put together a thing called the Renaissance Policy Group. And its purpose was the end of 96, early 97, was to say, okay, what are we going to do next? And we had some uh, a, a lot of conversation. Randy and I and uh, David Showquist and a couple others were uh, the staffing for that organization. It was headed by Roberto Guizueta from Coca Cola, and and it was uh, sort of reflected the kind of difference of opinion. There were probably a third of the members were black and other two thirds white, and uh, but. Uh, Basic thing was we brought in McKinsey and McKinsey sort of uh, compared us with other cities around the country, see who our peer cities were, something they typically do when they're doing city planning type work or policy work. And they found out that our closest uh, uh, peer city was Detroit at that time, end of 96, early 97. And I think people can generally accept the notion that our trajectories as cities have, have differed from that period forward. And so that was really important. And that sort of also reinforced and brought us together around the collaborations between the private sector, the public sector, and the community as best we could uh, to achieve a, a system of guidance 
that was reflective of and aimed at uh, in, in, in both the sort of sustaining of the physical environments that have been made, but also the ventures into serious social interventions that sought to redirect resources to where the needs were greatest. And that's a long, hard battle. It hasn't happened yet. I think it moved forward in this period. There are a lot of pros and cons that people can talk about it. But basically, the this chapter of the book, it's chapter five, uh, traces through collaborations with Central Atlanta Progress, with Georgia State, Georgia, uh, 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 Georgia Tech, uh, neighborhoods of different kinds. I think one of the things that that Coda's work did, we, we did have some community development corporations, that is neighborhood-based corporations seeking to improve themselves with whatever resources they had, which are never enough. I think a good example of that for, is, is in Kamanika Youngblood's work in, in Old Fourth Ward and her recognition that this was going to probably bring up back some gentrification and some displacement made special efforts to build projects that could accommodate at least seniors at an affordable level. I mean, there's just countless examples in which the city was seeking to bring its resources to where the needs were greatest, but at the same time, leverage its resources and use its resources to improve the quality of private development that was occurring as, for example, Peachtree Street, which pretty much ended at, uh, at Baker Street, uh, got carried forward by Midtown Alliance. And, and the city was uh, always a part of the city was in a party to the uh, transformation of Georgia State University from a totally inward community university to the largest university in the state. Likewise, <clears throat> Georgia Tech, uh, which had been a very insular uh, university uh, north of the events and venues uh, uh, under President Wayne Clough's guidance, uh, basically Turn, turn Georgia Tech into a resource for the broader community, which has ultimately led now to the Georgia Tech nexus with Midtown and, and uh, the digital uh, corporate community has become a real generator of a huge amount of economic support. So I think those things, I, I could go into you know, a lot of examples. And so I mentioned Atlantic Station. Atlantic Station was a fairly unique activity for, for the city and had a, a tiny sh shred of the uh, effectiveness that uh, COCA established in sort of re recasting uh, the value system for our st infrastructure, streetscapes, and walk walking areas and so on. Because it, it came about and the city required that if they wanted to, Charlie Brown who instigated that development, he wanted to develop it, uh, it would need to have the kind of urbanistic uh, uh, environment that had been created and was by now spreading to Midtown. And, uh, and we, for example, were able to use city resources and city authority to uh, uh, essentially shape that development to where uh, it required having 17th Street Bridge being built. It required having a free uh, shuttle system between the Midtown Marta Station and Atlantic Station. Uh, it, it required that no development could occur until the contract was through GDOT to build 17th Street uh, was had actually been uh, awarded to assure that the, the linkages, the, the accommodations, appropriations, the developer uh, went to 150 different community meetings before we got our, the zoning approved. And so uh, there, you know, there are probably 15 or 20 such examples uh, uh, in, in the book that, that I think would be of interest. Uh, and it'd be hopefully a way for people to see, oh, uh, this happened this way and that happened this way and so on and so forth. The actual spread of development from, I, I liken the uh, uh, emphasis of, 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 of the downtown and, and the Olympic ring uh, as before the Olympics, it was a very quiet place, not a very attractive place. People didn't like to really go downtown. Uh, apartment stores closed and so on and so forth. These Olympics are sort of like dropping a stone into a pool and then it's impl it's, uh, it's, its legacies have spread in different directions more to the west and, and, and north to, than the, south, than the uh, uh, west and the south. Although I would say that a lot of those community development corporations, whether it's uh, uh, Historic District Development Corporation, Old Fourth Ward or SUMEC uh, in Mechanicsville uh, or People's Town 
uh, up north, uh, uh, south rather, of, 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 of Summer, Summer Hill, Vine City, so on. Things began to happen and the city has always been underfunded with capital funding and, and we tried to make sure that we were able to establish some linkage between private investment that it redounded to at least some benefit for the neighborhoods that would be impacted. So with that, the, that part of the book is, uh, uh, I think, uh, of interest. And, uh, 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 and you know, again, when you get to Q&A, uh, uh, and it's also, also, I think it's important to point out, we haven't pointed out, we, we were trying to figure out what this book was. Was it a history? Was it this or that? We, we sort of think it's a mix of history and memoir because it's tapping all of our memories going back 25 years ago and, and doing the best we can to pull up uh, a range of exemplary and some not so exemplary developments that, that have occurred ever since. And I think our sixth chapter really ends with our various reflections. And I, I think we have a slide uh, to illustrate that, if I'm not mistaken. So this is a, sort of to frame the questions. We had reflections that had both positive and negative uh, connotations about the Olympics. Uh, uh, he talks about the hubris thing, quoting uh, Bert Routen from AJC on the kind, of, the, the kind of nature and culture of Atlanta that was on the one hand able to bring this rather stunning transformative event to the city, but has also not always been such, so successful as a start with a grand idea and, 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 uh, and the idea doesn't work, but the, but the image of the idea lingers. I don't know if you want to discuss more on that chapter. Uh, no, I think that I'd like to leave time for questions and answers. I just to do on this image on this page though, it's interesting. We've uh, added the, the belt line loop to the previous map. Um, which Beltline, of course, grew out of several initiatives and a master's thesis uh, around the Olympic period. Uh, and it continues the whole theme of con uh, connectivity where the corridors and other connections now begin to make connections to the loop. Um, that uh, is the, the ongoing uh, development uh, of, the, of the Beltline project. And so you see the yellow, yellowish circle there is the Olympic ring and then the Beltline and uh, the Peachtree Ridge, which we referred to in the book as the Ridge of Privilege, uh, is the kind of reddish corridor there just to show how this, uh, how these ripples have continued to expand since the Olympics. And really with that, I'm happy to entertain questions and answers. I don't know if you are, Mike, if you want to add something to it. Well, <clears throat> A brief comment on the former slide. Uh, it, it's uh, if we could go back one, um, or if we can't. Yeah, I think what's notable about this slide is uh, you see the pink strip, the peach tree ridge of privilege. No, not that one. The next one, please. That one. So I think uh, the points about connectivity, collaboration and interconnectivity and, and getting people to the, this is the most intense concentration of housing density, of, uh, event density, amenity density, sports density, office density, and so on in the city. And uh, uh, regrettably part of the, the bucket, the belt idea is that you'll see that it may have a connection someday up around Piedmont Hospital, but other than that, it doesn't really get as a transit system anyway, doesn't really get you to where most of the destinations are aimed. On the other hand, it's, it's a, a, a emerging as a very popular and very appropriately popular uh, path system. And I think the path system will be its uh, best remaining legacy. So I'm, I'm ready for Q and A. Let's see, we, we want to leave 13 minutes and we got 14 minutes. Great. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. And we have a lot of questions in the Q&A as I expected. So I'm just going to apologize in advance if we run out of time to get to all of them because there's some really good ones. And so I thought I would start with this one because you all were talking about, you know, the legacy of both the games, but then also a lot of the urban development that was happening throughout the 90s and even before then. 
And this guest, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, this question a little bit here, but this guest says, well, I recognize what the Olympics have done for the city. Um, I have deep concern about one byproduct of the games, which you all addressed a little bit. Um, this is about housing affordability. So I see lower income people, especially non-white communities being hurt. For example, I see people being forced out of public housing and other lower income housing with no adequate replacement for that housing. While at the same time, there's a lot of folks, um, usually younger white people moving in with higher incomes and moving back into the city. So they point out, you know, to qualify for affordable housing, you know, a family has to make 34,000 um, a year. So they want to know, um, do you agree or disagree that some of these programs might have ended up creating affordability issues? And regardless, if you agree with that, what, what solutions do you see potentially for the city um, to get more affordable housing available for people? Well, first of all, whoever asked, asked that question is absolutely right. Uh, the Olympics in reversing the, the downward trend of population investment and investment location uh, the, the real answer is resources from those who have the resources, which cities typically don't have. But there's a policy piece to this, too. And I think uh, I, I mentioned in Tamaniki Youngblood and the recognition of the risk of gentrification occurring in Old Fourth War, and it certainly has a, uh, occurred. And I think, you know, the answer in that, I'll just use that. There are a lot of other examples that I could speak to. I'll speak to that one since I started it off. Is that you know, she recognized this risk way back in the late 90s. Um, and she took whatever action she best could. And we gave her the best support we could, which wasn't much, not clearly not enough. But the tenor and the tone of that period from, you know, 1998 or nine up into the, into the early uh, uh, 2000s, um, we had, uh, we sought to gain leverage from private investment that would benefit the communities according to the bent community's desires and goals. Clearly affordable housing is one of those. It was, a, it was an issue and a problem there. And we tried to induce affordable housing and introduce affordable housing as a priority back then when it really wasn't. No one was paying much attention. Uh, it hasn't carried it very far. The now situation is not just in this city, but in every city and every state has become an urgent set, set of conditions. My thought about the strategies for dealing with this is sort of twofold. One is uh, if the gentrification and displacement occurs over 20 years or 25 years, at least it gives people who are affected by it time to adjust and time to consider their options and not just be beset upon some, some uh, uh, speculator who comes to a little old lady's house and says, I'll give you $50,000 for the house, and then he flips it for 200000 that kind of thing. So the community needs to be informed in order to do that. The second thing I would say about it is that new community development corporations were launched in that period. Uh, existing uh, community development corporations, I mentioned a few of them, uh, 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 gained ground and gained support to do their mission, which is, and there are a lot of groups right now in the city that are very impressively trying to actually address this problem. Uh, there's the FCS group in South Atlanta. Uh, there's the uh, Leonard Adams group in, in Vine City, English Avenue. Uh, there's Vine City, there's a, 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 a Sumac, I mentioned, Summerhill, People's Town. These neighborhoods are doing the best they can, and they're pretty good at it. And by the way, it isn't easy for a community development corporation to carry out their mission, which is to do exactly address as best they can the issue that, that the questioner raised. What wrong resources? We have lots of good locally generated, locally based, locally funded people. You know, two or three things that have to happen. They need to start gaining the same skill level and the production level uh, that a major developer might have. And they need to do it being paid maybe 25 or 30% of what a major development corporation is doing. But somehow we have to shift. And, and we, I, you know, for example, I'll give you another example. The, when we put the first tax allocation district in place in downtown Atlanta, it was downtown T uh, TAD, downtown T tax allocation district. Well, we uh, insisted 
we being the city, uh, Joe Beasley from uh, 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 Antioch Missionary Baptist Church, uh, that if we're going to do this thing that basically raises revenue to spend on public infrastructure, then 15% of whatever revenue is generated by a new investment downtown has to be spent in the neighborhoods immediately to the west. And so we tried to set up traditions of linkages between private funding and, pu and public need. So uh, I would encourage you to answer the question to uh, in that question to, to review who's out there and figure out how they can join and, and, and help. It, you know, there's, there's good stuff going on. Purpose Built Communities has done some good work in, uh, in, in the Grove Park area and the East, East Lake area. I could go on and on. You want to stop? You got to stop me. Randy, stop me. <laughs> it's all right. No. Uh, no, I, I don't have anything to add to that. Mike's quite knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that really thorough answer, Mike. I know it's a tricky issue <laughs> that lots of cities around the, the country are dealing with in, in different ways. So it's I, I, I notice on my screen that I've gone from Technicolor to black and white. <laughs> <laughs> I think the sun might be setting where you are. Um, so moving over a little bit more about the legacy, this is about MARTA. So Angela says, you speak a lot about MARTA. Uh, one of my favorite pieces of memorabilia that she has is a sticker from MARTA that says, I made 1 million friends thanks for Marta, thanks to MARTA uh, during the 1996 games. So was MARTA usage um, that happened during the games, was that something that was expected? And what effect do you think that the Olympics had on the further development of MARTA? Well, we during can, the games, there's quite an amazing uh, uh, agreement that was hammered out, negotiated between MARTA and ACOG, and I think perhaps the state, I don't remember, uh, where MARTA would run free for anybody with a ticket. You didn't have to pay. And so it was obviously extensively used. I remember personally being on very, very crowded trains uh, going to and from Olympic areas. And, and like I said before, sometimes you had to walk two blocks down a pedestrian corridor to get to the venue, but nevertheless, it served most, most of the venues that way. Um, and there, there were a couple of extensions uh, to stations further out that picked up parking areas. Um, I, some, I don't remember the numbers in the book, some 80,000 uh, parking uh, uh, spaces available for uh, for these Olympics to be actually kind of a park and ride Olympics where you could park on the periphery and ride in. So that, that scheme worked exceptionally well during the Olympics. Um, the extent to which it improved ridership since then, I think the numbers will show that it has, but I think they will also show that it's, it's been uh, uh, not necessarily significant increase in ridership. Mike, you might know the actual, uh, numbers, but there was a spike after the Olympics in martyr ridership. Yeah, and, and I, uh, just anecdotally, I, I spent a lot of time on the streets uh, during the Olympics, and uh, uh, I ran into any number of folks, and also in the, in the various meetings around the support with the county and the state and the city and ACOG and so on, uh, uh, running into white people who say, well, I, I didn't think I would ever actually ride MARTA, but this is great. And we like it and we probably use it. And I think they did. And there wasn't any real congestion going on uh, on, on the roadways. So or I think air pollution. The air pollution was non-existent during the Olympics. I, so I think the was driving in and people were taking MARTA and then just the traffic. Uh, yeah. It's sort of like COVID. It really didn't develop. Yeah. COVID dropped air pollution considerably also. And, and I think, you know, MARTA is a, is a really important and, and fundamental resource for, for the city, for the region. And it has been uh, uh, attacked uh, at the state level uh, and, and at the sort of upper ring level for, for years. I think people are beginning to recognize that uh, uh, it is essential for everyone. Uh, and, and on the other hand, uh, the kind of impacts of COVID uh, are, are, are devastating. I think MARTA has some initiatives going on right now that are, that are very promising. I think they're finally looking seriously at bringing uh, uh, transit to, to Gwinnett County. 
Uh, I think they're trying to compare. I think it's important for people to understand that the bus rapid transit becomes extension from the uh, uh, to, to the Northeast. Uh, they can get that done in maybe five years and about 20% of the cost of extending rail. But there are a lot of people somehow fall in love with rail without really understanding its implications. The major ones of which, where are you going to get the money because it costs a fortune? And are you really ready to wait 15 years for your rail uh, where you probably moved into town into a, into a, a, a support community or some sort? So, and, and the whole COVID impact, this is, again, it's a national issue. But I think MARTA is uh, doing the best it can. I think it's organizationally uh, doing better than it did back during the Olympic period, partly because it was still under such vicious attack by, by a lot of uh, white citizenry. I, I had a little thing. You know, there was a movie a long time ago that says, white men can't jump related to basketball. And I was saying, white people can't ride MARTA. <laughs> so, or can't ride a bus. So those things are beginning to gradually improve, and they have to. The city has to come together around common values to sort of recognize the flaws and the advantages and pay attention. Listen, I think, is the first thing. It's what we try to do. It's what we try to teach at Georgia Tech. Listen and try to hear before you formulate ideas and solutions and so on that may not have anything to do with what the real problems are. Thank you for that. Just two comments I wanted to read to you both, and then we have a couple more questions. An anonymous attendee just said, thank you for your presentation and contributions to our beautiful city and the legacy of perhaps the most successful games in modern history. It's a very nice comment there. And uh, we're joined by former mayor, Shirley Franklin. And she said, thank you for your research and hard work to tell this story, especially the vision and leadership of Mayor Jackson in the 70s and 90s leading up to the games. There's so much more to learn from Jackson's legacy and leadership. So I just wanted to share that both with you all. And kind of building off of that, we have a question um, from Chris, who is uh, writing in from Birmingham, Alabama. He has a two-part question. He said, one, um, have the positive impacts of the Olympics been sustained in Atlanta in your opinion? For example, cooperation between the white and black power structures of the city, and he shares that Birmingham will be hosting the World Games next year. And I know this could probably spur a whole other uh, conversation, but he asks you know, briefly, what are some best practices you would recommend to them? So it's a win-win for all of the parties involved in the city, the businesses, the neighborhoods, all of that. Well, as a former planning director of the city of Birmingham, I probably help on that one. Um, First thing I'd say is that I had, hadn't said is that in terms of success and maybe going back to the first question uh, is the, as I mentioned, the population had dropped from 500,000 to 400,000 roughly between the 60s and the early 90s. Now the population has gained back about 100,000 people. Uh, the black white uh, proportions have changed a little bit, but it's still a majority black city. Uh, the other thing that's going on that is really distressing to me and is solvable, but it takes a, a will that hasn't emerged yet to achieve that, the poverty level in the, in, in the, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s was about 20%, which means that there were probably 100,000 people living in poverty in that period. The poverty level in, in, the, in the 90s but now we're down to 400,000 people, right? Poverty level is still about 20%. So 80,000 people living in poverty. Now we're back up to 500,000 people still have 20% living in poverty in this city. So I did want to make sure I made that point. As far as Birmingham is concerned, it's interesting. I went to uh, Rotterdam was having a, uh, a European city of the year. And I was asked to come and talk on that same question, basically in Rotterdam ideas, what are best practices? Personally, I think best practices have to start with, and, and Birmingham, by the way, is a city that is unlike most cities in Birmingham, and Atlanta's not unlike, but that has a structured neighborhood program, a neighborhood system, which if the college wants to get in touch with me separately, I can give the history on that one too. But the premise of that is that the, uh, the citizenry needs to have a lead position, uh, at, like presently in, in, in the city of Atlanta there. 
NDUs and neighborhoods can have a significant impact on such movements as zoning and liquor license, stuff like that. Birmingham has that. I don't know what it has now. I haven't followed it closely. So I think you begin with a broad-based understanding of what it is, why you're doing it. It, it. it probably won't work very well and probably won't redound to dealing with the poverty levels in Birmingham unless you engage the citizenry through the neighborhood associations. There are a hundred of those in Birmingham, last I heard, and, and start listening, like I said before, and, uh, and really look for, okay, what can this do for us and us being everybody, not just low wealth neighborhoods, but all neighborhoods where people hold themselves in an equitable relationship. So I think, you know, I'm glad to hear that, that Birmingham is doing that. And, uh, and I think it can, I think the book actually has some ideas about how, how uh, uh, resources can be tied to uh, public benefit uh, and should be. And uh, I haven't kept up with the Birmingham. I, I did for a while. Thank you, Mike. And just closing out tonight, I'm so sorry that we weren't able to get to all of your great questions, but I promise you can probably find a lot of the answers in the book, which is available uh, for purchase from Atlanta History Center's museum shop. So one last question for both of you that I thought was a fun one from an anonymous attendee. They want to know, when you're driving around Atlanta today, what's your favorite Olympic legacy venue that you still enjoy seeing and visiting? Well, I'll answer that because we haven't talked much about the park. Um, I think Centennial Olympic Park is extraordinary because it hit all of the points of connection that we've discussed. And because for uh, a lot of critics who thought there was not an architectural monument befitting uh, other uh, Olympic grandeur around the world uh, that this city left a kind of negative space in the middle of the city, which is used extensively and perhaps more so than almost any other Olympic venue that you can visit around the world. And the development around it has really expanded and in, including aquarium museum and so forth and so on. So it was an extraordinary uh, act of will in a very short time. And it's been to my uh, find uh, a very successful in, in several dimensions. And I, I think that's the, the really uh, major legacy uh, physical piece from the Olympics. For, for me, I'd mentioned too, uh, the Martin Luther King silhouette coming from the east onto toward downtown is, is one. The other one is a shout out to Randy and happens to be in my front yard which is the Carnegie Pavilion at the corner of Baker and Peachtree Street, where West End, uh, West Peachtree is truncated. Uh, that's out, I, that's out some, outside my window. Randy, here's a whole long, wonderful story to tell you sometime. But Randy basically engineered bringing pieces of the old Carnegie Library and mounting them in a way that became a pavilion, which is probably the most photographed spot that I know of in Atlanta. Everybody from everywhere is always standing out in front of that pavilion getting shot. It happens to frame the vista down West Peace Tree. It's uh, terminated by a building that, uh, uh, that was a pretty distinguished building at the time. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a gathering place for, for everyone. Tourists, uh, models getting, you know, model shoots and all kinds of stuff going on there. Right now, it's a little, if, if you're planning to go there, be careful because there's an awful lot of kids on scooters that are rushing around this way and that way. And unless you're pretty uh, 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 agile, you, you might risk being hit. So anyway. <laughs> Atlanta, always top, keeping us. <laughs> Atlanta always keeping us on our toes, huh? So no, there is, there's another point that I would make about this is that we haven't really talked about the Olympic arts program that again, Coda and Randy had a central role in, and basically putting art in public places that had relevance to either the community around it or the artists who created it. And, and there was very little of that. And it's really, and now it's been recently refurbished and Randy's figured out a way to get people. Jennifer Ball at Central Atlanta Progress plays a role in keeping that stuff up and, and doing more of it. And I would say Beltline has been very successful in, in carrying out art programs that their genesis, their origin came with the 50 odd pieces that got installed 
in Atlanta in this period in time for the Olympics. Thank you for that. And there is so much. I want to make you blush there, Randy. <laughs> Well, Mike and Randy, thank you so much. This has been so interesting. And I know I learned something new and I know all of our audience did as well. So if you, um, again, if you don't have your copy of the book yet, you can purchase it from Atlanta History Center's museum shop. I put that link in the chat. I, we have a couple other things going on in Atlanta History Center related to the Olympics that I wanted to bring up because I know all the folks here tonight are big fans of those games. So the first is that, as many of you know, this week is the 25th anniversary of the start of the 1996 Olympic Games. So in commemoration of, in celebration of that, and uh, during the dates of August 24th to 27th to mark the 25th anniversary since the Paralympic Games, um, if you are a staff member or volunteer at those games, uh, we have an offer for you to get a free ticket to come to Atlanta History Center, check out the new exhibit, Atlanta 96, Shaping an Olympic and Paralympic City. So I'm posting instructions on how to do that in the chat. There's a code that you'll use when purchasing those tickets um, from July 20th, so yesterday until this Friday and August 24th to 27th. If you have any issues with that online system, you can give us a call, our ticketing number is there, you can find that information at atlantahistorycenter.com. Besides that, if you're an early bird and you're up for watching the Tokyo games in real time, we're having a free watch party on Friday um, at 7 a.m. is when the opening ceremonies will start. We have free coffee and donuts because we know it's early and you'll also get uh, free access to the exhibition as well. So lots of fun things going on. It was really fun to kick it off tonight uh, with this really interesting discussion. So. All that Claire, you might be careful because uh, you may have a run on those tickets because there were over 150,000 volunteers during the yeah, Yes, well, we, we thought of that. So um, <laughs> the tickets have to be reserved in advance and we still have some COVID protocols. So um, we know that basically it was that fifth of the city of Atlanta was volunteering during those games. So it, um, we, did, we did think of that, <laughs> but we're really excited to be able to offer that to Good. volunteers. Yeah, that's great. And you can find, I just posted a link in the chat if you wanna know any more about our screening or about any of the other things we have at the History Center related to the 96 Olympics, you can find that on our website. So Mike and Randy, thank you again for this really great conversation to all of our audience members here tonight. Thank you for your thoughtful questions and for joining us. And I hope that everyone has a great rest of their week. Bye now. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>